How's it going guys? Bloody Vintage here. Uh, I just wanted to show you the uh, the MK6 uh, gas pass bag haversack as well as the MK7 and some of the key differences to look for uh, for your early war impression. Um, so right here I have a 1940 dated, uh, very clearly and nicely dated, uh, and these are just, I have these just filled uh, temporarily, only the gas mask in the last one. Uh, 1940, uh, MK6, again on the strap, so that's kind of nice. This one actually, all the markings are faded, but judging by the hardware, it's an MK6, and I'll tell you why, and then the MK7 on the end. The one I don't have is the MK5, um, and I'll kind of explain to you the, uh, the difference uh, a little bit, uh, but that's not necessarily my realm of expertise. So basically the MK6 you would have seen uh, late in the fall of France, in, uh, you know, in the battle of the fall of France, not actually in the fall, uh, but I guess potentially. So these came out, uh, I believe, mainly in 19, 1940, early in 1940, uh, developed in 1939 to replace the um, MK5 haversack. So the main thing you'll notice about these is this is actually the back where you'll actually access your, your gas mask. And this would actually be at the front, and this is where you'd access, and actually these buttons are quite quite stiff. I'm supposed to show you it's been a, been a while since this has been opened. Oh wow, this is really stuck. So I'll, uh, I'll show you on that example, but basically in here, this is the same. So you have two, that's a little bit easier. You have two openings on the outside, so external openings. So this would actually be facing outward, so out with the chest of the soldier. Uh, so if I'm standing back here, this would be the front. At least that's how I've seen the Morn. Uh, again, I'm not uh, a military expert on this. I believe I got a sea broad arrow there. I'm not sure if it's Canadian or not. Uh, it's tough to see. So your anti-gas goggles will go in here. Your anti-gas um, ointment uh, in here, as well as some other uh, some other accessories. Um, but I won't quote exactly how that would have been. But the bigger one is for the anti-gas goggles, and this one has it too, as you can see. So that's the main thing of identifying the MK6, which both of these are. Uh, again, this is the MK7, and there's some obvious differences I'll show you later, but you know, you open this up. And this one actually do have the gas mask in, so there, I got my gas mask in there. Uh, MK7, 1942. And then literally, when I turn it around on the back, there's actually no openings. So the reason for that is that they moved the pockets to internal pockets. So same thing, you've got your uh, gas mask, um, sorry, your uh, anti-gas goggles in here. This one I've got sort of prepared a little bit nicer. You'd have your ointment in here and they made this a shallower. If you can see that, they made this a little bit shallower so it didn't fall to the bottom. Sometimes the anti-gas ointment and paste would fall down to the bottom, be hard to retrieve. Uh, and as well for your anti-dimming um, uh, stuff would go in, uh, in here as well. And then your your gas brassard would go in there. Uh, so that's to sort of explain the main differences with the with the flaps and how that kind of goes. They're still uh, similar in here. If you look, and I'll actually take out some of this packing just to show you better what's inside the MK6. So the one thing that they do share is they still. They actually both have that front opening for your gas brassard, uh, would, would be in here. Uh, and I actually got some, uh, some notes on anti-war gases. Uh, and then your uh, filter would go in here and face piece in here. So again, not much has changed in the internal compartments. It's the external that you're really looking for on the MK6. MK5 didn't have them and the MK7 didn't have them. The MK6 are the only ones. So that's an important note. Uh, the next big thing I'm gonna point out here, as I get rid of some of that padding, is actually how they're physically attached. So if you'll notice, this is an, uh, an early 1940, I'm guessing, MK6 example. So if you look, you got brass hooks on each end. So that's the first thing to note. If you'll note, this must be even a later model or possibly a Canadian one. This one is a brass hook on one end but not on the other, permanently attached on the other. And when you go to the MK7, because of war economy, uh, as they stated, there's no hooks at all. It's just simply just 
hooks right on or sewn on, I should say, even though you can probably take that off if you need to. So that's the first main thing to note. Uh, the next thing will be the actual um, rings. So you'll see external D-rings. So when it's literally facing your body, you'll see these external D-rings on the MK6. And the MK5, and I, and I believe World War I, Howard Sachs had these as well. The purpose is to get your rope and to be able to affix it to your body. So you'll see a center eyelid. Uh, that usually ends up being in the in the center of the, the neck. So this would actually go on the back of your neck and these will go underneath your arms and that way you could wear it in the emergency uh, position. Okay, I'll show you an example of that uh, maybe in a second, uh, but I'll have to re, uh, reset that up for you. Uh, as well, you have the, uh, the S hook for shortening it and that's kind of what this little eyelet is for. So again, if you had it in the sling position and wanted to quickly set it up for an emergency position, you could do it there. Uh, again, the MK7 actually has that uh, as well, but I don't really see a hook. So that's kind of an important thing to note. As you can see, it's obvious that this one has it as well. The earlier version actually threaded from inside of the haversack. This one may have as well. It might have just been cut off, I believe, actually. And then big difference, big, big, big difference is the MK7, you literally have just a rope that comes out of here. Sorry, this isn't actually tied on. I thought it was before I pulled that out and literally use it in the same way, but you go around and instead of just tying it to another D ring on the other side, you'll literally use what's called a whip cord and you'll pull it around a few times to effectively tighten it on to there. I've also seen some alternative uh, whip wheels or whipcord wheels. Um, some are just sort of like little spiral hooks, like two of them I've seen. There's a lot of random versions of these. Uh, many countries made them, obviously, Canada, Australia, Great Britain. Uh, that holds pretty good. So that's the main difference is you'll find the whipcord wheel only on the MK7 and beyond. Um, so as well, that's basically the main differences I wanted to show you guys. Um, as well, I'm not gonna quote this one because it's a Canadian version, as I understand. They they reduce some other brass. Uh, I have all the brass on these ones. So the two adjustment buckles, as I understand, I think some of them went to just one uh, for the, uh, the adjustment, uh, possibly some of the British versions. And all of them also have this little, if you can see it here, I'll give you a, a better close up on the MK7, is this little guy right there. Not 100% sure, but as I understand, that's kind of to secure to a button on your tunic uh, for mounted troops so it doesn't flop around as you're, uh, as you're riding horseback, uh, for example. So those are the main differences. Again, MK7, only the one flap. And then uh, MK6, the one flap at the back and then at the front facing out for your... Um, anti-gas go uh, goggles and ointments on the outside. And the main reason that was done is just for ease of use, ease of access, rather than have to stumble around and open it up and grab everything out of here while you're trying to also assemble your gas mask, you can do it separately and not have to shove everything into one bag. Uh, as well, I won't really comment too much on the, the Blanco standards. This one actually isn't Blanco, it's actually like a green, a green material inside and out. Uh, but these were known to have been blankoed uh, based on unit regulations. This one obviously isn't super faded, um, but sometimes they're blankoed green, so you might see that in the BEF as well. And then later in the war, or I should say mid-war, uh, you don't really see as much blanco, and you obviously don't really see much use of the, um, of the gas mask haversack uh, MK5, MK6, or MK7 because the light MK2 comes out, and I'll show you that to you guys as well before I forget. So um, I'm gonna set some things up and just show you how these would actually be attached. All right, so I've got a mountain on my mannequin. Uh, I'm gonna try and give you a two for one deal uh, to show you how uh, this one and the light MK2, uh, so you can ignore the bottom uh, part, late war. Um, just sort of turning quick and dirty. So again, this is the front facing out where your anti-gas goggles and ointment will go in. 
and then you'd fold this out and actually have, if I can show you there, and actually have access to your Havert sack right there. And if you look around, you're going to say, how the hell is this stain on this guy? Where I showed you the D-rings before, you see that going around the body. Now again, this should probably be on the inside through here. I just threw it on quickly. Should probably be on the inside of the cross straps. Usually the first thing you put on is your um, gas haversack. Now we're gonna look at the back and see how it will go on. So as you can see, again, once you actually have a body on this, this sort of purpose is to pull this down so it's not riding on the back of your neck and these go underneath your shoulders and reduce it flopping around. Um, so again, keeps it off your neck, keeps this from flopping around and your adjustment brass hooks as well. So that is kind of how that would be attached. And at the bottom here, I got the late war um, MK2 uh, light gas mask bag. Now again, it was worn many different ways. This is the only one to actually have um, fittings for the pattern 37 belt, if you can see that on the back. Sorry, I'm just trying to do everything in one, at once here in one video. Uh, maybe I'll make another better one later. Uh, so this has the quick release that you'd see in like kind of the pattern 1944 um, webbing or adjustments, I should say. And definitely see this uh, post-war as well. And again, you've got the gas mask in there. And literally, I just tucked in the strap. There's actually a loop where down in the bottom, you can actually take off the strap and hook it down there. And that's also where your um, anti-dimming uh, would go. And as you can see right back here, so there we go, light MK2, 1944. And your um, anti-gas goggles will go in the back there. Um, ointment inside, sorry, ointment would be in the side here, in the side of the pouch, as well as your, uh, your cotton wadding. And as well, there's another side for that material as well. So sorry, I know this is a bit of a quick and dirty video, but I just want to give you the idea of all those together. When I have a little bit more time, I'll kind of spread them out a little bit better and uh, hope you can better understand. But that's kind of what we're looking at for the MK6, MK7, and the light MK2. Those are the ones you'll principally see uh, used from start to the end of the war uh, in order. Uh, again, the MK5 I don't have, and you'd see in that early with the BEF, and being slowly replaced towards the end of the Battle of uh, France uh, with the MK6 and obviously Home Guard, etc. Okay, hopefully that gives you a good idea.